June 3rd of 1942. All is quiet as the sun is setting on the waters across the Pacific. But for the past three years, another sun has been rising, that of Imperial Japan. For months, she has done nothing but advance, taking island after island in a bloody offensive campaign. The Japanese Navy, to this point, has been essentially unstoppable. But that is about to change. The following day would see the American fleet clash with the mighty Japanese Navy, ending with a decisive American victory. But you know all of that. You know the main story and the common details of the battle that turned the tide in the Pacific. That's why in this video we will look into the untold history and cover the things that most have missed. So let's dive into the records, test your knowledge, and uncover what you never knew about the Battle of Midway. You might be wondering, what sort of beautiful recreation am I watching in this video? Well, let me tell you, all of the stunning visuals you are about to watch were actually made using the sponsor of this video, War Thunder. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, with more than 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships to use in dynamic and multiplayer battles. Each vehicle is incredibly detailed and modeled down to their individual components, creating a highly immersive combat experience. And best of all, War Thunder is totally free to play and is available on PC, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S, and previous gen consoles. Plus, all of the scenes in my videos are actually filmed with real TJ3 History viewers just like you, who fly with me in the recreations, and you could be one of them. This could include playing as a P-51, a Japanese anti-aircraft truck, or a German torpedo boat, and everything in between. So right after this video, download War Thunder for free at the link below and get a huge free bonus pack with premium vehicles, premium account, and much more. Help save history and come fly with me. Thanks again to War Thunder and now enjoy. To start off our list for today, we will cover the interesting backstory that almost changed the entire dynamic of this famous battle. To do this, we will have to rewind one month earlier to May of 1942 at the Battle of Coral Sea. Coral Sea would be an iconic clash, often overshadowed by the Battle of Midway, but in reality no less significant. In this battle that took place in the South Pacific, both the American and Japanese fleets met each other and exchanged blows in a battle that would be the first of its kind a naval battle in which neither side would fire upon nor see the other's ships, but instead was fought exclusively from aircraft launched from their carriers. Both forces in this engagement would be led by their fleet carriers, for the Americans, the USS Yorktown and USS Lexington, and for the Japanese, the Shokaku and Zuikaku. These were the most valuable assets to each fleet, capable of delivering a lethal amount of deadly air power to any target throughout the Pacific. At Coral Sea on May 8th of 1942, after days of searching, both fleets finally located the other. In a series of attacks, American aircraft landed key hits on the carrier Shokaku, while the aircraft from the Imperial Navy landed hits to both the Yorktown and Lexington. And this brings us to our first question. Let's begin to see what you know. In the Battle of Coral Sea, four fleet carriers took part, two from Japan and two from the United States. And in this battle, all would take some form of damage or loss. The Battle of Midway would happen just one month later. Of these four fleet carriers that took part in the Battle of Coral Sea, how many would go on to also participate in the Battle of Midway less than 30 days later? A, three, B, two, C, one, or D, none of them? The answer is just one. And it is this number that likely tipped the scales at Midway. And here's why. Once the smoke cleared at Coral Sea, both sides had done substantial damage to the other, but it appeared that the Japanese had scored a slight victory. In terms of ships sunk, this was accurate, 
which is why the battle is often referred to as a tactical victory for Japan. But as we can see here, it is considered a strategic victory for the United States. This is because of the four fates of the carriers following this battle. First, the USS Lexington, which took the most damage in the battle and was in very bad shape, but still floating. However, an electrical fire ignited fuel aboard the ship and she was eventually forced to be scuttled and written off as destroyed. In addition to this, both of the Japanese carriers were crippled, but in very different ways. The Shikaku on May 8th was hit by multiple American dive bombers, which did critical damage to her flight deck and lit her aflame. Because of this, immediately following the battle, she had to head back to Japan for repairs. The Zuikaku, the other Japanese fleet carrier, was actually not physically hit at all. By good fortune, she happened to be hidden by a passing storm while the American aircraft were attacking. The United States aviators landed back on their carriers and reported that she had escaped, undamaged by their strike. But in reality, she had taken a different kind of damage, that of nearly all of her air crews. In the attacks on the American fleets, the poorly armored Japanese planes had taken high losses. After the attacks that damaged both the Yorktown and the Lexington, 23 of the 69 aircraft that were launched never came back shot down by anti-aircraft and American fighters. Furthermore, upon landing, another 12 were written off as damaged beyond repair and pushed overboard into the Pacific. This left the Japanese with less than half of their original air power. And the few planes that were left were mostly Zeros, which were really not capable of dealing blows to ground targets or ships on their own. But in addition to the aircraft, the Zuikaku and Shokaku had lost many valuable air crew members, as each Val dive bomber that was lost carried a crew of two, and each Kate a crew of three. These losses would prove to be far more difficult to replace than that of aircraft. With all of these substantial casualties and losses in the battle, the Zuikaku also had to return to Japan to get new crews and aircraft so that she could fight again. This meant that both of the Japanese mighty fleet carriers, despite only one of them actually being hit, were both out of service and headed back to Japan. But the USS Yorktown would be the only carrier from Coral Sea to see combat once again at Midway. And to the Japanese, this would be like seeing a ghost. Like the Lexington, the Yorktown was also damaged badly at Coral Sea. In fact, the Japanese flight leaders, after landing, told their fleet commanders that they had destroyed both of the American carriers after watching multiple confirmed explosions upon each. So, after Coral Sea, the Japanese Navy believed both the Yorktown and Lexington to be resting on the ocean floor. In fact, we can even see a political cartoon from a Japanese-American newspaper showing Uncle Sam dejected near the cross of the USS Yorktown. This was printed on May 13th of 1942, five days after the Battle of Coral Sea, when the Japanese believed that she had been lost. The mighty Yorktown, however, was not dead. She was certainly hurting badly, but was able to limp all the way home back to Pearl Harbor. When the Zuikaku and Shokaku landed back at Japan on May 17th, it was estimated that it would take two or three months to fully repair the Shokaku and replace the lost air corps of Zuikaku. The Japanese, being a strictly by-the-book military, did not consider replacing the lost air crews of Zuikaku with a combination of men from Shokaku and instead opted to get a completely new group of crews when they were fully ready and trained. This made both aircraft carriers unavailable in early June for Yamamoto's planned invasion of Midway. No real effort was ever made to have either one fully operational for the battle. After all, they believed that the Americans had lost both the Yorktown and the Lexington, leaving only two others remaining in their fleet. This miscalculation would be a crucial mistake. 
Upon arriving at Pearl Harbor on May 27th, the USS Yorktown was immediately sent to dry docks. Admiral Nimitz was told that the repairs to the carrier would take an estimated 90 days. He told them that they had three. For the next 72 hours, crews at Pearl Harbor worked around the clock to make only the most crucial repairs needed. Three days later, the USS Yorktown sailed out of Pearl, with three boilers inoperable and a top speed of 27 knots. She was far from fully operational, but she could carry aircraft and float, and that was what mattered. But also like the Japanese, the USS Yorktown had taken major losses to her air crews and aircraft at Coral Sea. But unlike the Zuikaku, the US Navy was willing to replace these losses with crews from a different ship. So while they were in Pearl, three of the Yorktown's aircraft squadrons were replaced by squadrons from the USS Saratoga. The Japanese, on the other hand, played by the book and wanted to wait for an entirely new and trained air crew to be ready for the Zuikaku. The sum total of all this set up a crucial advantage for the Americans before the legendary clash had ever started. At the famous Battle of Coral Sea, the Japanese Navy had taken damage to only one carrier, but both fleet carriers present in the battle would be missing at Midway. While the United States Navy, who had lost one carrier and taken critical damage to another, would repair the surviving fleet carrier in time to play a major role at Midway, while the Japanese were still under the impression that she was at the bottom of the Pacific. Coming in next for this list is a fascinating and unknown story from within the crucial flight that discovered the Japanese fleet near Midway. Now, most everyone knows that the Japanese force was discovered by a PBY Catalina patrol right before the battle began. But let's try and test your knowledge anyways. What was the date that the Japanese invasion force was originally discovered and reported by an American patrol plane near Midway Island? A. June 2nd B. June 3rd C. June 4th or D, June 5th? The correct answer is B, June 3rd of 1942. And if you were able to get that, then good job. But I can just about guarantee that you didn't know this story presented by our good friend, Peter Haig, an SBD Dauntless pilot for the CAF's Air Base Georgia and Battle of Midway researcher. We all know about the events of June 4th, where uh, Catalina from Midway discovered the uh, position of what they thought were two of the four carriers in Condensely, and after that the, uh, the battle began. But really, what really convinced the command in Pearl Harbor and Admiral Nimitz was that on the day before, on the morning of June 3rd, a PBY Catalina spotted Admiral Kondo's invasion force that was actually south southwest of the island of Midway. So that report came back as main body. It confirmed that the, the, the target was Midway and that Leighton was correct, their intelligence was correct. But the real story is that in, when they began reinforcing Midway Island, they flew in a bunch of Army B-17 bombers. Well, the crewmen of one of the uh, PBYs got talking to these B-17 crew and the B-17 crew, well, we have these new explosive 50 caliber rounds. And they said, well, we want some of those because they were afraid of the Japanese. They said, we want these rounds. So he gave them five rounds of this 50 caliber explosive ammunition. I believe the starboard gunner had three rounds, the port gunner had two rounds. So they took off on their mission early in the morning of June 3rd. They got out to the very extent of their range and they were about to turn around and the crewman whined and said, hey, we want to try out these rounds. So the pilot, Lieutenant Reed, said, all right, we'll go 15 more minutes. So they flew west 15 more minutes. They said, all right, guys, it's time to turn around. They said, well, come on, 15 more minutes. So the aircraft commander, Jack Reed, said, fine, 15 more minutes. So at the end of that 15 minutes, 30 minutes after when they should have turned around, that they discovered Admiral Kondo's invasion force. 
And what this did was that for Admiral Nimitz, there was no doubt in his mind that now Midway was the target and he found the invasion force. And consequently, he ordered Spruance and Fletcher, who commanded the aircraft carrier task groups, to move closer to the positions that they would have been at on June 4th when the battle began. So the Battle of Midway might have been won by just five bullets. A story that sounds like it's from a movie. The PBY that located the force on June 3rd and thereby confirmed that Midway was the target for the Imperial Japanese Navy may have never seen the invasion force had it not been for a few rounds of new ammunition for its gunners. Up next is a fascinating story that actually relates to the historical filming of Midway. And you might be thinking, wow, you have some absolutely fantastic footage here. Surely this isn't actually from the Battle of Midway. But let me tell you, this is 100% legitimate and filmed from Midway Island itself during the legendary battle in 1942. And this footage comes courtesy of none other than a celebrated Hollywood film director. Allow me to introduce you to John Ford. Ford was one of the most prolific film directors of the 1940s, having won multiple Academy Awards for various films before World War II started. After the outbreak of the world conflict, however, there was a new need for filmmakers, not in Hollywood, but on the battlefield. This new war would have to be filmed for research, propaganda, and newsreels. And who better than the hottest filmmaker that Hollywood had to offer? So in 1942, John Ford was recruited to work for the Office of Strategic Services, making documentaries on the war for the United States Navy. And in June of 1942, Ford happened to be in the perfect place to capture all of the action, Midway Island. Believing that he was sent here to film what it was like on a remote military base during the war, Ford initially filmed a great deal of the daily life of the personnel on the island. But on June 4th, he was awoken by the sound of gunfire. He leapt from his bunk and took one handheld camera with him to film the action from the bunkers on Midway Island. For the remainder of the attack, he shot some of the best footage that we have of the attack on Midway. Making this feat even more impressive, during the filming, Ford was even struck in the arm by a Japanese bullet. He refused medical treatment until the battle was over, however, and made sure that he got all of the footage that he needed. Following the filming here, all of the footage was put together into a short film entitled The Battle of Midway. When FDR was shown this footage that Ford had shot, he replied back by saying that he wanted every mother in America to see the film. This short movie would win another Academy Award for Ford and was a hit back in the United States. This brings us to our next question, and this one is going to be quite hard. In John Ford's 1942 Battle of Midway short movie, who does the narrator call the natives of the island that Tojo is trying to liberate? A. Japanese prisoners B. American women C. Birds or D. Midway's personnel Funny enough, the answer is actually C. Midway's birds. These are the natives of Midway. Tojo has sworn to liberate them. Don't worry, that one was pretty tough. You've got two more coming, so let's see if we can get those. Before we move on from Ford's filming though, we must mention that in the days before Midway, the famous director had also spent time with a group of Navy flyers who would later be known as the infamous Torpedo Squadron 8. In this time, he filmed them in great detail, and we can see the footage here. In just a few days, however, nearly every young man in these clips would be dead. Following Midway and the loss of 29 of their 30 crew members, Ford had this footage compiled together into another short memory to commemorate VT-8. It would later be sent to the families of the aviators lost. And this actually takes us perfectly into our next point, 
another fascinating detail on the story of Torpedo Squadron 8. And I'm going to go ahead and pause right here, because I know that many of you are already getting your comment fingers ready. So I'll go ahead and get to our next question. What was the accurate paint scheme of the TBD Devastators that took off from VT-8 during the Battle of Midway? A. The circus paint scheme with yellow, red, and blue. B. The plain gray with the red dot roundel. C. The plain gray with the plain white star roundel. Or D. The plain gray with star and bar roundel. The answer here is C the plain gray with a plain star roundel. We can see this clearly from Ford's footage that was shot just a few days before the Battle of Midway. The bar was not yet added and the red dot had just been removed. In fact, in some of Ford's footage, we can even see the remnants of it just being painted over. So allow me to explain that I apologize, but due to the limitations of my flight simulator, the circuit's paint scheme from earlier in the war is the only one that I have available for the TBD Devastator. So please hold off of your comment fingers. I know this isn't perfectly accurate, but we will have to live with it for this recreation. Now that we have that sorted out, back to our story of VT-8. One of the saddest stories of the Battle of Midway is the, the plight of Torpedo Squadron 8. And of, this was the squadron that took off from the Hornet, where Jack Waldron turned his squadron away from the rest of his, his aircraft uh, carrier group, Air Wing, and flew directly into the Japanese and was the first uh, American carrier borne aircraft to engage the enemy. They uh, were set upon by a number of Zeros, and every aircraft in that squadron was shot down, and there was only one survivor, Ancient George Gay, who witnessed a lot of the battle. But how exactly did this happen? Where were the rest of the aircraft from their air group? For starters, part of the reason is because it was not exactly easy to launch a large coordinated strike force from an aircraft carrier. You had a speed differential between the bombers and the fighters, and the fighters would have to weave up and down over the top. Well, the fighters did not have the range, so they were wasting fuel weaving. So the Yorktown came up with the plan to do a running rendezvous where they launched their slow airplanes first, their devastators. Then they brought up on deck their dive bombers and fighters that flew a lot faster. And the idea was the torpedo bombers would take off and then the dive bombers and the fighters would, would catch up to them and they would arrive over the target area at the same time. What happened was that the Enterprise launched all of their bombers first and their bombers were supposed to circle and then the torpedo bombers and the fighters would launch second, join up, and they would fly in a mass formation to the target area. But unfortunately, this isn't exactly how things would go. Upon locating the carriers on June 4th, Spruance, the commander of the Enterprise and Hornet, had a predicament. He realized that he had the perfect opportunity to strike first in the battle. So he could either take his time and launch a large coordinated strike, or he could focus on striking as soon as possible, ensuring that he would maintain the element of surprise. He opted with prioritizing surprise. This meant that the squadrons and air groups would be separate and less effective in their attacks, but they would get there much faster. This guaranteed his first blood and would likely delay the Japanese in their efforts to launch a counterattack. This was likely the best decision as the Americans were not yet very good at launching coordinated carrier attacks. To put into perspective just how much better the Japanese were at carrier warfare in 1942, the Japanese had launched 108 aircraft in just seven minutes, while the Americans in their initial strike took over an hour to launch 117. So, as expected, with the disorganization of this strike, the air groups were separated from their own squadrons. The attack that was ideally supposed to happen all at once ended up with the torpedo bombers of VT-8 arriving first, all alone and ripe for massacre. As tragic as this was, however, with the loss of the whole squadron, there is one forgotten detail that might make it even more gruesome the fact that VT-8 
could have possibly been saved. The sad story about this is that above Torpedo Squadron 8 was Fighting Squadron 6 off the USS Enterprise. Fighting Squadron 6 was supposed to follow their torpedo bombers, Torpedo 6, and if they got into trouble, the commanding officer Torpedo 6 was to radio Jim, come on down, which he would descend and help them with their defense. Well, above, Commander Gray from, torpedo, from Fighter Squadron 6 picked up Torpedo 8 and followed them. And when they were attacked, he never heard the command, Jim, come on down. So subsequently, the entire squadron of Torpedo Squadron 8 was wiped out in the battle when if the commanding officer of Fighter 6 had said, well, we're going down and help, maybe the outcome would have been different for Torpedo Squadron 8. For this final point in the video, we will cover the dive bombers, but not the ones you might be thinking of. These ill-fated dive bombers would be the forgotten Marines. As the attack on Midway Island by the Japanese Air Forces was about to begin, the commanders on the island were already planning their own strike. Knowing where the Japanese fleet was and that a raid was incoming, the wise decision was made to try and launch the bombers that were stationed at the airfield to go and hit the Japanese carriers. After all, if they stayed on the island, they would simply be sitting ducks on the ground. Unfortunately, this strategy required that the fighters remain behind to defend Midway Island, although in reality they would do so very poorly. So in the early morning, 16 dive bombers took off from the airstrip at Midway without escort and were headed to strike the Japanese fleet. Here they would be led by Lofton Henderson. And in case that name sounds familiar, that is because the famous airfield at Guadalcanal would later be named in his honor. This brings us to one more question. How old was Major Lofton Henderson when he led the Marine dive bombers in the opening attack of the Battle of Midway? A. 39 B. 28 C. 23 or D. 19 if you have any reasonable knowledge of history, you would likely say C or D, as most pilots during this time were very young, often just boys, with many even lying about their age to get into the war. But that wasn't the case here. Lofton Henderson, as he led this flight, was 39 years old. And I can tell you that without any doubt at all, in all of my research of air combat in World War II, that is by far the oldest pilot that I have ever seen go into combat. I think what always impresses me is that a lot of these pilots are very, very young, 25, 24, 20 years old, and just how mature they were. And you always hear that combat is a young man's game. So to be 39 years old and leading these kids into battle, uh, it's really amazing with all the stresses of combat, the stresses of command, and being 39 years old. I think it's a real testament to, to his mindset to be 39 and leading a squadron into battle for the first time. So as the elder statesman of the Marine dive bombers went in, he was far from equipped with an elite unit. Half of the aircraft under his command were SBD Dauntless dive bombers and the other half SB2U Vindicators. And because, as we learned earlier, our Hollywood film director John Ford was stationed on the island of film, we do have some of the actual footage from the Marine aircraft taking off for this June 4th attack. Here we can clearly see the Marine Vindicators taking off of Midway if only they knew the difficult fate that awaited them. At this time, in 1942, the SPD Dauntless was a fairly respected plane, but the Vindicator, on the other hand, was quite a bit older. It was slow and outdated, with a weaker defensive turret defending the 6 o'clock position. Furthermore, the Marines were not trained quite as well as the Navy dive bombers. Thus, in their attacks, they actually tried to execute what was called a glide bombing run instead of a traditional dive bombing attack. 
These were not as accurate and exposed the aircraft to a great deal more gunfire from carriers and defending Zeros. Because of these factors, their attack did not go well. Eight of the SBDs would be shot down, along with two of the Vindicators. It is also likely that all of the Vindicators would have been shot down if the Japanese fighters had not used all of their ammunition on the SBDs first. Among the dead would be the 39-year-old Lofton Henderson, who was shot down during his bombing run. But that does not necessarily mean that his contributions were without a significant gain. I think the Marine pilots, the young Marine pilots, are very inexperienced, very new. Some of them, I don't believe, had flown the airplane before they even got to Midway. But really what they contributed was that they delayed the landing of the strike force from Midway with their attack so that you had the Dauntlesses from Midway attack and they delayed the landing of the Japanese uh, attack force and then came in the slower SB2Us and delayed it even further. So what they actually did was they lengthened the timeline or shortened uh, the time that Nagumo couldn't bring his his uh, <clears throat> strike force up on deck and launch until we got to the famous 1020 when the, they were getting ready to bring them up to launch on, mid, on the carriers at Midway when the Dauntless has found them. Because of this delay, the Battle of Midway swung towards the favor of the Americans, who did not miss their opportunity, eventually sinking all four of the Japanese fleet carriers. Furthermore noteworthy, however, is the fact that this was not the only valiant effort by the Marines at Midway. The following day, on June 5th, the surviving Marine Vindicators took off yet again with a new leader. This would be the 24-year-old Richard Fleming. Fleming led the other dive bombers in a risky low-level attack on the Japanese heavy cruiser Makuma. Undeterred, he pressed on and took a direct hit. His bomber took substantial damage, but he carried on to release his bomb. After a close miss on the cruiser, their SB-2U crashed into the ocean, killing Fleming and his gunner. This courageous attack would result in Fleming receiving the only Medal of Honor given for combat at the Battle of Midway, not to the SBDs or to the Navy at all, but to a Marine pilot of an SB-2U Vindicator. The Makuma would be finished off the following day, sunk by American aircraft along with all four of the Japanese carriers, turning the tide in the Pacific and helping to win the war for the United States. Now, before we go, let's make sure you check off all of the items on your debriefing before you head for home. One, download War Thunder at the link below, since it's awesome and I used it to make literally all the visuals in this video. Two, join the TJ3 History Patreon here for awesome bonus content, like a behind the scenes look at the aircraft carrier that we're shooting this video on right now. Three, check out the Commemorative Air Force Air Base Georgia and their beautiful SBD Dauntless at the links below and give them a like for helping to make this video possible. Four, subscribe. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.